Have you ever wondered why Black Panthers wore berets? Or where the phrase mumbo jumbo comes from? Well, those are the two questions I'm going to answer tonight. And if you have your own questions, you can reach out to me at whatmykistry.com in the contacts page. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so. I'm going to buy me coffee on my Patreon page in the description below. Give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. This morning in the Atlanta airport, no one's missing a meal on Mac Wilburn's watch. With 11 restaurants to serve passengers, he's got dining for every destination. And it all started when Mac talked with First Horizon Bank about opening a franchise in the airport. Now it's open for business and cleared for takeoff. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Have you ever wondered why the civil rights movement wore their Sunday best? or why the Black Panthers wore leather jackets. Well, these iconic images of past protests demonstrate that dress can make a political statement. Black people chose the styles that they wear in order to influence public opinion on racial injustice. Through fashion, they were able to express their views and send a powerful message to the American public. During the mid-50s and early 60s, Black people in America fought against injustice and inequality, including racial segregation and disenfranchisement. In an effort to combat racial stereotypes like the idea that black people are lazy, inept, poor, or primitive, that further discrimination against them, and some leaders of the civil rights movement upheld nonviolent protest methods, including sit-ins and freedom rides and bus boycotts and marches, these methods were intended to dignify the movement and humanize the thousands of participants across America fighting to be fully integrated into a system in which they had been denied. And fashion played a big role in communicating that. And those in the fight needed to send a message. And that was a message of respectability. One that was intended to elevate the black community in the eyes of the greater public. A sharply dressed, modest black body worked as a tool in conjunction with the passive efforts of the nonviolent protests. Women who participated in the movement wore neatly pressed hair, cardigans, button-ups, and stockings under their skirts with modest hemlines. Men did the same, marching in dark colored suits that were overstarched, white undershirts, and ties. Black Americans were considered to be the bottom of the social hierarchy, so it meant a great deal they would challenge that vision by wearing the Sunday best. These aesthetics of this period spoke to being non-threatening at a time when a black man could just as easily be beaten or jailed for their mere existence. These smartly attired leaders helped usher in major legislative victories like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Denim also played an important part in the civil rights movement. In the rural southern United States, denim overalls and jeans were traditionally seen as clothing of black sharecroppers, and the black middle class wanted to distance themselves from this image. But the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee reclaimed denim workwear to show solidarity with the working class and to make a powerful statement about class and respectability. Denim was also more suitable for these student activists than dresses and suits. During the late 60s, though, a new kind of politics and style emerged among the younger generation of the black community, desiring to take more immediate action and demonstrate a more powerful leadership than their predecessors. The Black Panther Party was formed. This party was the complete opposite of the current civil rights movement, advocating for black power and self-defense, instead, as they called it, politely asking for their civil rights. Their uniform embodied this new attitude. Up until that point, black nationalist groups had adapted many acts of their cultural garb from Africa, like wearing head wraps and arc necklaces. But founders of the Black Panther Party, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, opposed this aesthetic because it's opportunistic cultural practitioners operating as front men to further the exploitation of black people and impede the real revolutionary struggle. The Black Panther uniform consisted of leather jackets, powder blue shirts, black pants, gloves, shoes, gloves, and the famous black beret which was picked up after Newton and Seale had watched a movie on the French resistance to the Nazis during World War II. They felt that it was a strong symbol of militancy, and this was the militancy that they wished the Black Panthers to convey. In the same way that civil rights leaders had dressed to convey an image of respectability to white people's preconceived notions of black people, the Black Panthers dressed the way to send a message of black pride and liberation. Also, the color black during the Panther era was reclaimed as a source of power and pride. 
They would refute the idea of black being bad. And this is when the mantra of black power and black is beautiful began to surface. That's when the natural hair movement got underway with Afros becoming a statement of their own. The rule dictating the look or behave a certain way or what was right were completely abandoned. In recent years, protest attire has gotten more casual. T-shirts with political messages have become the norm. During Occupy Wall Street in 2011, people showed up wearing jeans, T-shirts, hoodies, and shorts, making it easier to mobilize within their cities. During the Black Lives Matter movement, not only were T-shirts being worn during the protests, but they showed a variety of messages. The T-shirts worn usually would have statements like, I can't breathe, or the names and images of people who had died in state-sanctioned violence. Since the 1960s and well into the 70s, t-shirts have become a popular way in a fairly inexpensive medium to convey a message that could be mass produced and quickly circulated. Beyond being worn, they signaled a person's alignment with a particular movement. Even today, whether the messaging is obvious or nuanced, African Americans continue to protest against injustice and no matter the decade, they continue to dress in a manner that conveys their political message to the American public. For our second story tonight, we're going to talk about the racist origins of the phrase mumbo jumbo. Webster's Dictionary defines the phrase mumbo jumbo as jargon or an otherwise confusing language. However, the phrase has a more interesting origin originating in Western Africa. In the 1700s, Francis Moore, a travel writer, documented the term mumbo jumbo in his book Travels into the Interior of Africa. Moore describes mumbo jumbo as a masked dancer which is involved in certain religious ceremonies. The Mandinka people were said to dress up in the character wearing a masquerade habit in order to resolve domestic disputes. While the exact origin of the word is uncertain, experts suggest that it's derived from the word Mamba Jambu, which is derived from the Manic people. By the early 1800s, English speakers started to apply the African phrase and mixing it with anything that confused them. In the 1896 edition of Farmer and Henley's Slang and Other Analogies, Mumbo Jumbo is described as a grotesque idol supposedly worshipped by African people. It wasn't until the early 20th century where the meaning of mumbo jumbo began being divorced from its African origins and became what we know of today an unnecessarily involved or incomprehensible language. Thank you. I'm your host, Country Boy. And this has been One Mike History. I'm going to continue with this mini series. And if you have questions or you just want to leave your comments, like I said, you can do so at onemikehistory.com in the contact page. Thank you for listening and peace.